is the man who confronted Moses. Can it be that Achmose's father remembered the Israelite prince he grew up with, and when he gave his son his Egyptian name, Achmose, the moon is born, he chose the name because of a play on words. In Hebrew, Achmose means the brother of Moses. In history, Pharaoh Achmose is most famous for expelling a foreign nation from Egypt around 1500 BCE. At the time, Egypt was ruled by a people that the ancients called Hyksos. Until recently, little was known about the Hyksos. Then, in the 1960s, their ancient capital, Avaris, was discovered north of Cairo. No one has ever been allowed to film at Avaris. To get there, we needed the cooperation of the Egyptian authorities. They're concerned that in the volatile Middle East, the discovery of biblical artifacts will somehow strengthen modern Israel's claims in the area. As a result, the Exodus is a touchy subject in Egypt today. So we didn't mention Moses, and we stressed that we were interested in Pharaoh Ahmose and the Hyksos he drove out of Egypt. This is Avaris, a walled city dominated by palaces. 3,500 years ago, it was surrounded by branches of the Nile. Avaris was discovered by Professor Manfred Bitak of the University of Vienna. Although only a few acres are exposed today, in ancient times, Avaris seems to have dominated the area. Avaris itself uh, was much bigger. It was uh, 250 hectares, so it extended from here uh, to the east uh, about two kilometers, and from here to the south, perhaps even one kilometer. In the Hyksos period, this was uh, one of the major residents uh, of Egyptian pharaohs. Egyptian history clearly states that the Hyksos, who ruled mighty Avaris, were Semites like the Israelites, and that they left on a mass exodus, known as the Hyksos Expulsion. Currently, most scholars date the exodus to 1270 BCE, during the reign of Pharaoh Ramses II. But some scholars are now breaking with that consensus. The Bible gives information that would put the Exodus about 480 years before the early years of Solomon, in the middle of the 15th century BC. Four hundred kilometers south of Avaris is the tomb at Beni Hassan. As in the Bible, the scene involves bearded Semites riding donkeys and bringing their families and flocks into Egypt. Like the biblical Israelites, they are wearing multicolored tunics. The hieroglyphic inscription on this wall calls these people the Amo, God's people. Until now, no one has come up with a comprehensive scientific explanation for all ten plagues. The answer began to take shape for us after we returned to the Achmos Estela and discovered an amazing synchronicity with the biblical text. The Bible says that the God of Israel passed judgment on the gods of Egypt. the stella confirms that the statues of the gods of Egypt were toppled to the ground. Earthquake storms are uh, sequences of large earthquakes that sweep across 
uh, large areas. And the best examples are the Eastern Mediterranean, where we have long historical and archaeological records. But what do earthquakes have to do with the biblical plagues? Well, let's begin with the first plague. Earthquakes can't possibly explain how Moses turned the Nile's waters into blood. Can they? In fact, they can when they trigger gas leaks. And we don't have to go back 3,500 years to prove the point. In 1984 at Lake Manu, and in 1986 at Lake Nios, both in Cameroon, the sweet, clear lake waters suddenly turned blood red. The mystery was solved when Professor George Kling explained the phenomenon in terms of an underground gas leak. The first thing that happens in such circumstances is that the water becomes devoid of oxygen and all living things in it die. The fish then begin to float in the polluted waters, rotting in the sun. The only things that do not die are frogs. Unlike fish, they can hop out. And as it turns out, biblical plague number two is a frog infestation. The lack of clean water then leads to lice, flies, and bacterial epidemics among humans and domestic animals. Not surprisingly, biblical plague number three is lice. Plague number four is flies. And plague number five is an epidemic. Plague six is boils and blisters, man and beast. Can an earthquake-induced gas leak explain this kind of outbreak? Let's go back to the 1986 disaster at Lake Nios, Cameroon. At the time, people living along the lake developed strange boils and burns. It turns out that carbon dioxide mixed with air put people into a kind of coma, reducing circulation to the skin causing the kind of boils described in the Bible as plague number six. Despite the first six plagues, the Bible records that Pharaoh still refused to let the Israelite slaves go. So Egypt was now struck by plague number seven, hail. And it was a very unusual hail involving ice and fire mixed together. To this day, Rabbis teach that the biblical description is no metaphor. The seventh plague was the plague of hail, but the Bible describes hail in a very unique manner. The hail was together with ash, with fire. The idea being that the fire and the ice commingled together, they coexisted together. The Bible then describes God as making a miracle within a miracle, taking opposites in nature and having them coexist together. Incredibly, there is an Egyptian papyrus that tells the exact same story. It's called the Ipawar papyrus. The Ipawar papyrus specifically states that Egypt was struck by a strange hail made up of ice and fire mingled together. Another piece of the puzzle has fallen into place. Now seems clear that the biblical and Egyptian texts are describing what scientists call accretionary lapilli, volcanic hail that could only have come from the earthquake-induced Santorini volcano. When the ash cloud goes up to, to great distances in the stratosphere, essentially what happens is you have moisture in the atmosphere you also have a lot of water vapor in the cloud itself. so the small fragments of ash and crystals actually form a nucleus something very similar to a hailstone in other words egypt experienced fire and ice raining from above just as the bible describes 
cold weather produces a drop in their body temperature and makes them land en masse. The volcanic hail and the weather disruptions caused by the Santorini eruption would have forced great clouds of locusts, which are common in this part of the world, to suddenly land in Egypt. As the hail storm cleared and the temperature rose, so did the locusts, exactly as the biblical account describes. Darkness. When the final eruption came, it created an ash cloud almost 40 kilometers from top to bottom and 200 kilometers across. When the ash cloud reached the Nile Delta, it engulfed the Egyptians in what the Bible calls a palpable darkness. In a matter of a few minutes, they're plunged into a black world Ash is falling around them. They can't see, they can't breathe very well. The sun has disappeared. You have black overhead, and they have no idea what's going to happen next. We had to look through 10 to 20,000 grains to find one ash grain. So we found a total of 40 ash grains. Not all ash looks the same. Ash has a fingerprint aspect. The ash particles that we find in the northern and northeastern Nile Delta are individual grains that came in from Santorini. There's very little room for doubt that the Exodus account and the descriptions that we have in Egypt of this, uh, the volcanic dust coming into Egypt and geological description where we can actually see, feel, touch, and date the, uh, the volcanic dust in the Nile that they are describing the same tremendous volcanic event. Every firstborn male Egyptian died. Every house was affected. No one has ever been able to offer a plausible scientific explanation for the death of the firstborn. Until now. According to our scenario, at this point in the sequence of events that began some six months earlier, the gas leak that set the chain of plagues in motion would have finally erupted. Carbon dioxide would have seeped to the surface and being heavier than air, would have killed animals and sleeping people before it dissipated harmlessly into the atmosphere. In case you think all this is conjecture, Consider this, it happened in exactly the same way in 1986 at Lake Nios, Cameroon. On the fateful night of August 21st, the villagers at Nios went to sleep. They couldn't have known that the carbon dioxide gas, which had turned the lake blood red, was now reaching a critical point. And a landslide took place, sending rock into the water disturbing the surface pressure and releasing the gas. The gas then rose to the surface and like some alien monster emerged from the water. Droplets forming on it, turning the invisible gas into a visible fog. The fog then rolled across the water and across the land, suffocating everything in its path. The next day, those who had been sleeping on higher ground woke up to find some 1,800 people dead. Hundreds of cattle and small animals also dead. All around, there was deathly silence. Egyptian firstborn males had a privileged position. They were the heirs to the throne, to property, title, and more. They slept on Egyptian beds, low to the ground, while their brothers and sisters slept on rooftops, sheds, and in wagons. The Israelites sitting up at their first Passover meal did not feel a thing, while the low-traveling gas suffocated the privileged Egyptian males sleeping in their beds. At Avaris, Professor Manfred Bitak has found mass graves dating to before and during our date for the Exodus. 
The earlier graves are classic examples of ancient epidemics that killed men, women, and children. But at the time of the Exodus, the mass grave he found has only males in it. Here you see bones of burials from the early 18th dynasty. They are all male victims. By the size of the graves and the number of the individuals in the graves, we think people died in rapid succession. And uh, the individuals were just thrown into the pit, uh, some of them lying on their stomach, some lying on their side. Some of the pits were just uh, 20 centimeters deep and uh, just some dust uh, put on top of them. Since we claim that Achmose is the pharaoh of the Exodus, we should be able to prove that Achmose's son died young. We found Achmose's son. The prince had died young. He was only 12. For the first time ever, we can put a face and a name to a victim of the biblical plagues. It seems that the Bible, geology, and archaeology are all telling the same story. The skeptics, who would like to regard the Exodus as myth, might resist the idea that it actually happened. Because this would imply that God does indeed exist. The greatest miracle of them all was the parting of the sea. After the death of the Egyptian firstborn males, Pharaoh let the Israelites go. He then changed his mind and pursued them, finding them trapped on the shores of a sea. The Hebrew text calls this sea Yam Suf, and it was here where the miracle occurred. The sea parted, the Israelites crossed to safety, and then the waters came back swallowing the entire Egyptian army, overturning chariots, drowning all the horses and soldiers. They've mounted underwater archeological quests, looking for ancient chariots, swords, and any evidence of drowned Egyptian armies. It also provides us with the first archaeological evidence for the parting of the sea. On this stone, Moses is called the Prince of the Desert. And then, the granite corroborates the miracle of the parting of the sea. The symbol can be read by anyone. Three waves and two knives. The parted sea.